The subject of today's session, the legacy of Noah, is God's covenant with Noah and his progeny, all of humanity, including us. And of course, it has innumerable implications with respect to us and our relationship with God. And in particular, as we've had occasion to note in the past as well, with respect to the Noahide laws that in our tradition are binding on all of humanity. But before we actually get to the Noahide covenant, which is in Genesis chapter 9, a bit of background. We go back to Genesis chapter 4, which, of course, as we all realize, follows immediately on the heels of Genesis chapter 3, the sin of Adam and Eve. And what we quickly encounter in Genesis chapter 4, after the sin of Adam and Eve and their banishment from the Garden of Eden, is a progression that goes woefully from bad to worse. Let's just consider some examples here. First, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, And Cain spoke unto Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. The first murder. Fratricide. And some verses later, in verse 26, also in chapter 4, we read on another subject. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Now, the continuation of the verse in the Hebrew, as huchal likro b'shem Hashem, which could be rendered in English either as then began men to call upon the name of God, or alternatively, then began men to call others with the name of God. There's an expression here of beginning. Beginning that may be understood as beginning to call the name of God, but may also be understood as the beginning of paganism of idolatry, deifying what is not divine. An interesting linguistic observation, the Hebrew that is rendered here as began, huchal, comes from the root letters in Hebrew, chet lamed lamed. Now, those root letters we've noted on many occasions in the past, that in biblical Hebrew, all words are declinations of essentially three letter roots. The same three letter root, chet lamed lamed, has a number of other declinations that have different meanings. Chet lamed lamed, halal, also pertains to hollowing out making a void. It also pertains, the chalel, to profaning, to an act of desecration. And we can well appreciate the connection among these here. Because on the one hand, as we read famously in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, the seraphim call one to another, and said, holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That is inescapably the reality. The earth is full of his glory. But then we have the capacity, if we so choose, to engage in an initiative, to change that status quo, to begin to begin in a manner that contravenes the whole earth 
is full of his glory by, so to speak, hollowing out a void in which his glory is not manifest, an act of profanation, an act of desecration. And perhaps indeed in that vein, they began, they profaned, calling others with the name of God. It's interesting to note that in the first chapters of Genesis, we encounter that ambivalence between beginning and profaning in some other contexts as well, just noting briefly. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, and Noah the husbandman began and planted a vineyard. Same root in the Hebrew, Vayachel. And we know what happened next. He drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Profanation. And in, indeed, a very different context, but nonetheless, same word. We speak of the city and tower, the Tower of Babel, that the children of men built. And in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, God said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. Achilam, in the Hebrew. Again, same root, beginning and profaning. But returning to chapter 4, we encountered murder, we encountered idolatry. We continue in the beginning of chapter 6. Again, that same ambiguous word, hechel, beginning or profaning, in verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the B'nai Ha'elohim, which we could in principle render as sons of God, sons of rulers, of the judges, of the great ones, we realize that Elohim in Hebrew means source of power. Anyone who is the source of power may be called Elohim, these sons of these powerful individuals saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives whomsoever they chose. They are the powerful ones. They chose. And there is a clear undercurrent here. They chose, not necessarily whom the women had chosen, and not indeed necessarily in any manner that would conform with what God instructs. So there's a connotation here, mating, that signifies sexual immorality. That there is a negative connotation here becomes patently clear in the following verse. In chapter 6, verse 3, God said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for that he also is flesh. There's something decadent that takes place here. But when we consider in summation, what we've seen in these passages, again following on the heels of the first sin of Adam and Eve, we've encountered bloodshed, we have encountered implicitly idolatry, perhaps more literally, alien service, deifying what is not God. And we've encountered sexual immorality. As you may well know, three sins that represent the cardinal sins in our tradition. Sins in the event that one is held under compulsion to violate any one of them, for which one is expected to sacrifice one's life rather than violate. And sins that are all 
included in the corpus that we will be discussing shortly, the Noahide laws. But more on that a little bit later. First, we continue now, later on in chapter six, in considering the generation of Noah, the generation of the flood, and the indictment of that generation, of which we read chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. And there are a number of motifs, a number of dimensions that are expressed here. We'll need to elucidate them. And the earth was corrupt before God. What does corrupt mean here? Now, before we continue, I feel compelled to share with you. I remember years ago when I first embarked upon these Bible studies and in this context delved into the connotation of corrupt here, I remember ruffling some feathers because the complaint was, I was getting so picky on in considering the meaning of the words in these verses. To which my response was, you bet I'm getting picky on. This is the word of God. We pay attention to every detail. And of course, then it dawned on me that if one is accustomed to reading the Bible in translation, one really can't pay such careful attention to detail because one never knows. Are the details actually there in the text? Or are they simply an artifact of the translation? Which is why we don't study the Bible in translation. In Jewish biblical scholarship, there is no tradition of reading the Bible in translation. We read in the original. The word that's rendered here as was corrupt is the tishachet. Once again, seeking the three-letter root, shin chet taf which admittedly in context here is ambiguous because we aren't told what the corruption was. Uh, but if we consider a passage later on in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 16, the context here with the same root becomes crystal clear. Here it is. Lest you deal corruptly and make you a graven image even the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. In the Hebrew, pentashitun, the same three-letter root. So, we can fairly well surmise that the connotation of corrupt in this context is the corruption of idolatry. That is sin number one expressed in these verses. The second half of chapter 6, verse 11, and the earth was filled with violence. Once again, we focus on the Hebrew. The word rendered here as violence is Hamas. I should stress, this is Hebrew, folks, not Arabic. The uncanny resemblance to the Arabic world is something that isn't relevant for our purposes. It certainly is tantalizing. But when we consider the meaning of Hamas, here too, we solicit guidance from some later appearances of the word in scripture. Consider in Isaiah chapter 59, verse six, we read of the act of violence, and violence here, once again, is indeed Hamas. Now, the English translation reads, is in their hands. But that's actually not what we read in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, we read bechapehem, which literally means not in their hands, but in their palms. And in exactly the same vein, we read the self same expression in Jonah chapter 3, verse 8, the royal edict in Nineveh, for everyone to repent and return to God, speaks of repenting from the Hamas, again rendered here as from the violence. And again, the English says, 
that is in their hands. The Hebrew doesn't say that. The Hebrew says, Bechapihem, in their palms. Now, the hand can be used for all sorts of forms of violence. One can strike with a hand. The connotation of palm is how you take possession. Taking possession violently of that which belongs to another. The connotation then of Hamas is stealing. We consider after these two crimes are intimated in chapter 6, verse 11, again, idolatry and stealing, the implication in verse 12, where we read, God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And once again, we consider the connotation of flesh. Now, arguably, in invoking the word flesh, even if I were not to solicit support from other biblical passages, we might well surmise, turns out correctly, that flesh carries a carnal connotation, a sexual connotation. But let's not merely rely upon our, our intuition here. Let's consider the first passage in the Bible in which the word flesh in the Hebrew, basar, appears, and indeed appears repeatedly. It is in Genesis chapter 2 where we read about the creation of the woman. In verse 21, where the word flesh, basar, appears for the first time, it is that after God takes one of Adam's ribs or sides, he closed up the place with flesh instead thereof. And when the woman is brought to the man, his reaction is, in verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And the culmination of the union between man and woman is described in the exalted words of verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Again, basar, le basar echad. Now we should stress, of course, these verses don't have any negative connotation whatsoever. On the contrary, an exalted view of how precious, how holy sexuality can and should be. But that's precisely what is debased when it is the flesh that had corrupted their way. We'll note one other instance before this verse, chapter 6, verse 12, where flesh appears, and that is immediately on the heels of chapter 6, verse 2, which, as we noted, intimated sexual immorality. God's assessment, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for that he also is flesh. So, in chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, we have another list of three sins, clearly reminiscent of those cardinal sins that we saw intimated in the preceding passages in chapter 4 and earlier in chapter 6. Of course, with a crucial difference. That is, idolatry, paganism, we saw in both passages. Sexual immorality, we saw, likewise. In chapter 4, verse 8, I remind you, we encounter the sin of murder, of bloodshed. In the generation of Noah, the generation of the flood, it's not murder, it's stealing. And yet, simultaneously, I submit that it's driving at the same crucial conclusion. This is 
an idea that, if I may share with you, is articulated by one of the foremost scholars of the 16th century, Rabbi Judah Loi, the Maharal of Prague, where he notes that while the generation of Noah, the generation of the flood, is indeed one that is pervaded by iniquity, the cardinal sins can only be represented in terms of idolatry and sexual immorality, because if indeed murder had totally covered the world in the generation of Noah, there would have been need for no flood. A society that is rife with bloodshed instantly self-destructs. So while an individual can be faulted with the three cardinal sins of murder, idolatry, and sexual immorality, a society couldn't possibly be characterized by murder because a society that is rife with murder doesn't exist. But murder, after all, signifies the ultimate act of taking what belongs to another, taking another person's life. Well, stealing isn't taking a life. There is indeed a crucial difference qualitatively and quantitatively. But the same essential idea, taking what belongs to another. So in the generation of the flood, we encounter these three crimes. Two already encountered, idolatry, sexual immorality, and also stealing. At this point, you may note that our arsenal of iniquity features four sins, the four sins that have been identified in human history since man leaves the Garden of Eden and enters our world. We'll see those four sins on the list of the Noachide laws as well, but once again, we're not quite there yet. Of course, the obvious point to appreciate in considering where all this iniquity is leading is what we read in verse 13, by consequence, the end of all flesh, God says, is come before me. And of course, inevitably at this stage, one can't help but view all of the foregoing as one sorry tale of woe from beginning to end. And yet, I feel compelled to share with you that in this passage, there is, ironically, a glimmer of great light, something that's even inspiring. And that is the expression that we encounter at the beginning of Genesis chapter 6, verse 12, simply, and God saw. In the Hebrew, Elohim. Now that expression, God saw, is one with which we're very familiar at this point because it occurred repeatedly in Genesis chapter 1. Recall in the description of creation, over and over again, beginning in verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. In verse 10, after the separation of the waters and dry land, and God saw that it was good. In verse 12, after the creation of vegetation, and God saw that it was good. In verse 18, with respect to the division between the luminaries of day and night, again, God saw that it was good. In verse 21, after the creation of animal life, the fish of the waters and the fowl of the air, God saw that it was good. And finally, in verse 25, 
after the creation of beasts, cattle, all terrestrial fauna, God saw that it was good. After it all, and in particular, after the creation of man, a new threshold in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God saw a rousing and inspiring expression. And of course, inevitably, we need to consider what exactly does it mean? What does it mean in creation? What does it mean in Genesis chapter 6? Of course, it should be clear to us what it definitely does not mean is God saw like, if you'll pardon the analogy, a mediocre artisan who produces his wares and then uh, takes a couple of steps backward in order to evaluate, well, how is it? How did it turn out? Is that what is meant by God saw that it was good? Of course, it's obvious to us all. Clearly not. God is not a flesh and blood artisan, and all the more so not a mediocre one. God saw is not because God needs to establish that what emerged is what he had intended. God saw, rather, is a profound statement that has colossal theological implications. We're familiar with the doctrine of deism, that God creates the world, but then, as it were, walks away from it. He only creates the world, but there is no providential involvement of God with the world afterward. And God saw in the progression of creation is a definitive refutation of that doctrine, because God saw always after the act of creation is complete. There is an ongoing connection. And not only is there an ongoing connection, there's an evaluation. God saw that it was good. Judgment. Assessment. Again, God has not abandoned the earth. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, it was still all very positive. Again, God saw that it was good. At the end, he saw that it was very good. In Genesis chapter 6, God saw that it was very bad. In verse 12, God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. But still in all, there is something profoundly inspiring, exalting, in the realization that God has this ongoing relationship with the world. Even after everything has seemingly spun out of control, the world is not abandoned by God. It is assessed by God with all the colossal implications. And when we consider just why that is a source of inspiration, we consider inevitably one additional dimension that was first articulated in Genesis chapter one. We noted it implicitly here in verse 27, describing the creation of man, but let's consider the matter in greater detail. A matter that is expressed in Genesis chapter one, when man is created, reiterated in chapter five, and repeated once more in chapter nine. In chapter nine, in a context that is extremely relevant with respect to our discussion of the legacy of Noah, the Noahide covenant today. What's so significant here? Of course, what is of utmost significance as expressed already in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, is just what? The endowment of humanity is. And God said, let us make man. The translation here reads, in our image. We might better render that as with our essence. With a godly essence embedded in man. And like our likeness. And indeed, 
So God creates man. In verse 27, God created man, again, in his own image, or alternatively, with his own essence. In the image or essence of God, created he him. The imprint of the divine in man. And likewise, in Genesis chapter 5, where we read in verse 1, this is the book of the generations of man. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. An interesting point of note. This is the book of the generations of man. Which book? What is the object of this? Arguably, the entire Torah. And I must share with you in this regard, there is a discussion and debate in our tradition with respect to which verse in the Bible most encapsulates within it the essential message of the Torah. And one view is, it's this verse. Because the most essential statement to make is, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, that we are imbued with that God likeness in each and every one of us. And that is the essential foundation, the essential encapsulation of the entire Torah. And of course, it doesn't only apply to Adam, because we read in verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. We know which likeness that is, the likeness of the divine. Like his image, or essence, and again, we know which one that is, the essence of the divine. And he called his name Seth, so that Adam bequeathed to Seth that God-likeness with it, which he was endowed, and likewise Seth to Enosh, to his progeny, to all generations, that God-likeness endures in each and every one of us, and by consequence imposes upon us responsibility. We return to that motif once more in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Capital punishment for the crime of murder. For in the image of God made he man. What's the connection between the first part of the verse and the second? One possibility, of course, is in as much as man is created in the image of God, how dare the murderer commit his act of murder, slaying another human being who is endowed with that God likeness, who has the image of God within him? That's one way of saying it. But there's another that I submit is deeper yet and more sublime. The murderer was endowed with God-likeness. How dare he commit an act of murder when he has the imprint of the divine within himself? How could he commit such a crime? And so, when we consider in summation this description of the creation of man, this too, obviously, is part of what, on the one hand, we find so vexing when we see how man has become corrupt. But simultaneously, it's so exalting when we consider what man can become, what man is summoned to be because of the God-likeness with which he is endowed. Now, all of this, I remind you, is all background. It's all, so to speak, the backdrop upon which we are exploring God's covenant with Noah, with all of humanity, with us, and the consequent laws 
that God imposes upon Noah, all his progeny, all of humanity. So after all this introduction, where do we actually see the Noahide laws listed in the Bible? And I must admit, the answer is really nowhere. That is, I could share with you that in our tradition, there is a homiletical association of the seven Noahide laws with the verses that we read in Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. I could tell you that, but the truth is that I would be so hard-pressed myself to defend the relevance of the words of these verses with the Noahide laws that I think we perforce recognize the association is purely homiletical as one of the greatest scholars in our tradition, the 11th and 12th century sage Rabbi Judah Halevi notes the homily could not possibly be an actual literal understanding of the verses. What do these verses say in chapter two, verses 16 and 17? Nothing about the Noachid laws but they do tell us something crucially important, nonetheless, as background. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowing good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And what is so significant about these words? Very simply, this is the first command that God gives humanity. And as such, encapsulated within these verses is the hallmark of human greatness. The animal kingdom, much less lower levels of existence, cannot be the recipient of the divine command because lacking that God-likeness Nothing besides man has the capacity to receive the divine command or to choose to obey or disobey it. Man does. This first command given to humanity is in some sense the template, the basis for our recognizing. Life is a gift, but with strings attached. God has expectations of us. And that brings us most directly into the arena at last of Genesis chapter 9, where we read of God's bond with humanity expressed in verse 1 as God blessed Noah and his sons, and more relevant for our purposes in the commands that then ensue. We don't read a list of the Noahide laws, but we do read a couple of crucially important examples. That is, after verses two and three that grant humanity license to eat meat, a license that was withheld from Adam and Eve and the previous generations, we read in verse four the prohibition only flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. The prohibition on eating a limb that is taken, that is torn from a living animal, that too, as we will see shortly, is on the list of the Noahide laws. And as we already noted in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, the sin of murder beginning in verse 5, at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man? Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. The prohibition of murder. Also, as we've already noted, among the Noahide laws, granted 
These are only two examples. But there is a more general observation to be gleaned from what follows in chapter nine. In particular, what we read God saying to Noah and to his sons with him in verse nine. As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And indeed, this is a covenant with the entire world as it is expressed in verse 11, again with reference to the covenant. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the essence of God's covenant with Noah and his seed, his progeny, and all of humanity. Except that one immediately senses there's something crucially lacking here. That is, the covenant is a reciprocal relationship. All we've read here is one side. What God has undertaken, as it were, as his obligation to never again cut off all flesh by the waters of the flood. What about our obligations? So on the one hand, indeed, they are not stated here. They are not stated here except by the implication of it being a covenant. If it's a covenant, well, of course, God is enunciating his part, so to speak, of the bargain. The obligations that he has undertaken. He doesn't enunciate here the obligations undertaken by man, but obviously they're there. And of course, as you will appreciate, as we've discussed elsewhere, in as much as we believe on an ongoing basis, together with the written text of the Torah, there is an oral tradition. The oral tradition provides further elaboration. I'll also inevitably note that in as much as these verses follow immediately on the heels of the earlier verses in chapter 9, well, we clearly have intimation of those Noahide laws, the prohibition on eating a limb torn from a living animal, the prohibition on murder. The others, indeed, are not explicitly stated here. Again, they are implicitly stated. There is a covenant. God has expectations. Those expectations, indeed, will pertain to all of humanity. Now, what are they? We've been referring to the Noahide laws over and over again. First thing we need to do at this point is to consider what they are. So let's go through them. We've already made reference to most of them, but to consider them all together, there is a prohibition on murder. There is a prohibition on idolatry. Where, again, we're going to define idolatry, not, of course, in terms so crass as bowing down to a statue, deifying what is not divine, alien service generally, and sexual immorality. These three, of course, the cardinal sins. And in addition, there is a prohibition on theft. There is a prohibition on blasphemy. Blasphemy, literally cursing God in God's name is, upon reflection, as absurd as deifying what is not divine. That is, if one believes in God, one obviously shouldn't be cursing him. If one does not, one shouldn't be cursing in his name. So this, too, is banned in the Noahide laws. And the last prohibition to which we've also already made reference, no eating a limb that is taken, that is torn from a living animal. These six prohibitions and a seventh positive injunction to establish courts to enforce one through six, establishing a legal system. Of course, the establishment of a legal system is on manifold planes the foundation of any civil society. We need to consider 
why these six prohibitions have the kind of foundational status that they do. And in appreciating why they have the roles that they do, I think it is of value to us first to consider the roots of God's covenant with Noah and all of Noah's descendants, all of humanity, by mapping the essential components of life. What I mean by that, there are three domains. The world inside, our own selves. We can describe that in terms of a relationship with self. And then, of course, there is also the world outside. We can describe that in terms of our relationship with others. And finally, the meaning beyond. Something that goes beyond both self and others, and that ultimately is our relationship with God. I feel compelled to share with you the third set of ellipses here is based upon a passage that is undoubtedly among the earliest in post biblical literature in the Ethics of the Fathers, one of the oldest tractates of the Mishnah. We read the statement of Simon the Just, one of the first of the post-biblical figures, a high priest after Ezra the scribe, who tells us the world stands on three things. The three things being Torah, service, and active loving kindness. Now, of course, we're not talking about the world standing on three things. We mean human beings stand on these three things. Because these three are the three pillars that constitute the three essential relationships that are the basis of life. That is, we can readily appreciate our relationship with others is expressed affirmatively, positively, through acts of kindness. Our relationship with God is, of course, expressed through service. While the third vertex here may be less obvious, considering that what Torah most essentially means is teaching, teaching us the refinement of ourselves, it is what corresponds to a healthy, positive relationship with self. And these three pillars then implicitly summon of us to take each of these relationships, relationship with self, relationship with others, relationship with God, and elevate, exalt, make holy each one of them. When we consider that as the core message of life itself, we can well appreciate why the prohibitions of the Noahide laws, the six prohibitions we just enumerated, are indeed axiomatic. Here, once again, I solicit the assistance of one of the great sages to whom we've made reference today, Rabbi Judah Loi, the Maharal of Prague, who notes that. The three cardinal sins, murder, idolatry, and sexual immorality, in fact, correspond to these three pillars. That is, a crime that constitutes the negation of one of the essential pillars of life renders life itself not worth living. Even if under duress, under compulsion, one is required to violate one of these crimes or be put to death oneself, better to choose death. 
Because life, after having violated one of these, truly is not worth living. Obviously, what represents the utmost negation of active loving kindness, giving to another, is the utmost act of taking away from another, murder. Obviously, the utmost negation of service, serving God, is serving something else, idolatry, alien service, deifying what is not divine. And to the extent that we discern, again, in Torah, the most essential pathway towards self-refinement, the utmost negation of that, perhaps surprisingly, is sexual immorality. Why so? Consider. We all are endowed with various drives, but the principle among them, the drive to preserve our species, the drive to preserve ourselves. The drive to preserve our species, the drive of sexuality. The drive to preserve ourselves, the drive towards food. These both are drives that we have that we share with the entire animal kingdom. These both are drives through which we could debase ourselves and behave like animals. Animals engage in sex indiscriminately. Animals also eat indiscriminately. As human beings, we are summoned to express our humanity through the acts that derive from these two drives, through sexuality and through food. Well, first, sexuality. The prohibition on sexual immorality, on incest, on licentiousness, is a prohibition against debasing ourselves, voiding that godlikeness, and stooping to the level of a beast. And so, sexual immorality is the utmost negation of Torah, which again is that course of self refinement, the teaching that enables us to become godly beings. These three sins, again, constitute the utmost negations of the three essential relationships that define the human condition. And so they are, most directly, sanctifying all the essential components of life, which is what the Noachide laws do. Except, of course, we're not finished yet because we've only talked of the first three. Then there are another three. And upon further reflection, we recognize they are, in a sense, a reiteration of the same themes, but on a more subtle plane. Because the summons of the Noachide laws is for us to exalt, uplift, make holy our lives on all these levels. That is, in considering then the affirmation of active loving kindness, not only is murder banned, but so is theft. Give to others rather than the taking away that these two crimes signify. The negation of serving God would be committing the folly of idolatry, deifying what is not divine, and as well, blasphemy, cursing God in God's name. So these prohibitions then serve as the means through which we elevate and exalt and make holy our relationship with God. And finally, in exalting uplifting and making holy our relationship with ourselves, besides addressing the sex drive that could be taken as a summons to self-debasement, descending to the level of the animal, and for that we have a prohibition on sexual immorality, there is also avoiding the debasement 
of our drive to eat, the drive of self-preservation, that could perhaps be taken to justify our eating like an animal. An animal, indeed, dismembers its prey without any regard to its suffering. The summons of not eating a limb torn from a living animal, of course, most basically, we will appreciate, is to ban the grotesque cruelty manifest in tearing apart an animal and eating it while it is yet alive. But of course, there's more to it than that. Because if the prohibition of a limb torn from a living animal were simply the avoidance of cruelty to the animal, then it would have nothing to do with our eating it. It would simply be a prohibition on tearing a limb from a living animal. The prohibition on eating it is the debasement of the act of eating. So again, this is in our relationship with self, exalt, uplift, make holy. The Noahide laws are all about that. These three relationships through which on every level we bring godliness into our lives and make ourselves godly. Integration of that God-likeness with which we are endowed. And uh, this brings me to a crucially important comparison. Because you may be familiar with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, in the wake of his critique of pure reason, he felt compelled after having dislodged the supremacy of religion to reestablish some credence to morality besides the personal predilections of individuals. And so Kant enunciated what he regarded as a universal moral code, one to which we are all duty bound because we can understand by exercise of our own logic that there is a code of morality that must be present in society. In Kant's formulation, any behavior that we realize were it rampant in society, would result in the destruction of that society, is necessarily immoral behavior. We might feel inclined to violate that code of morality when it is expedient for us. But we all understand that were society to violate that code of conduct, it would self-destruct. An obvious case of point, again, murder a society in which murder is rampant is a society that ceases to exist. Same thing for theft. And we should note that Kant, from his perspective, had thereby reestablished on some plane the primacy of religion by establishing a universal moral code that was a social and rational imperative, a defense of religion. Reportedly, the priests of Germany expressed their gratitude by calling their dogs Immanuel Kant. Because when one considers the implications of the Kantian moral imperative, uh, yes, they do provide for human beings not behaving as lowly criminals. But that's all. And of course, you will note that of the Noahide laws, the only ones that really can be identified as Kantian moral imperatives are the prohibitions on murder and on theft. The Noachide laws we indeed regard as imperatives, but not imperatives because all that is imperative is the preservation of society. Imperatives because God has endowed us all with a sense of right and wrong 
and yes, a craving to attain meaning, a craving to attain godliness, a craving to integrate that godliness in our lives, and thus to be able to appreciate that each one of these prohibitions in the Noahide covenant would be our moral undoing, but not the morality of Kant, the morality of striving for godliness. Now, there's a crucial implication in what I just said. And it's crucial also in our considering why indeed we don't have a concrete passage in the Torah that enunciates this list of the Noachide laws. Well, of course, you might well note we don't have such a list because it would be of little avail considering that we regard the Noachide laws as binding for the entire world. Note, we should stress, for no one do the Noachide laws represent a ceiling. They're simply a foundation. But as a foundation, they signify the baseline level at which every society needs to function in order for it to be considered a human society. But as such, you don't need to be taught that these prohibitions are prohibited. Someplace deep down within the recesses of your soul, you realize it. In the parlance of philosophy, this is an autonomous code of morality. You need not receive it from another. You need not be taught it. You can intuit it. You can appreciate it from within. This is an idea that, besides explaining the Noachide laws not being listed in the Torah, and besides enabling us to appreciate why indeed we regard them as binding to all of humanity, even people who never heard of the Bible, much less of the God of the Bible, the Noachide laws, as far as I can see, don't require anyone to believe in God just not to deify what is not divine and not to curse God in God's name, which again, as we've noted, is an absurdity. But besides these observations, they also lead to a crucially important corollary in terms of how we know right and wrong. That brings us to a fascinating passage in Genesis chapter 18, where in particular, we read of Abraham's pleading for God's compassion on behalf of the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what is most germane for our purposes, just to excerpt this in brief, is, and Abraham drew near and said in verse 23, will you indeed sweep away the righteous and the wicked? In verse 25, that be far from you to do like this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? Let's consider the implications of what Abraham is saying here. Because indeed, we should appreciate this is a revolutionary statement. People tend to view religious people as in a way, what we could describe as moral automatons. They simply obey what God tells them to do. Many non-religious people think this is the case, and I suspect many religious people do as well. We should appreciate the extent to which Abraham's words give the lie to that claim. Because if indeed we learned to define what is right versus what is wrong, simply by observing what God does, it should be clear to us, Abraham's challenge here in verse 25 would be absurd. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? If God does it, it's justice. No. Abraham's response is, no, 
I have an inner moral compass that tells me what justice is. And if you slay the righteous with the wicked, you are violating my moral compass, says Abraham to God. Now, of course, I'm being a little bit overdramatic here. We recognize that, as Abraham undoubtedly recognizes, the moral compass was placed there when he was created by his creator. But the crucial point to appreciate is it still operates autonomously. I don't need to learn from you now what constitutes justice. I know it within myself. And that likewise is what enables me to know within myself that violating the Noahide laws is wrong. I don't need to be taught them. I don't need to read them. I know it. And indeed, we should consider in this regard what serves, so to speak, as the preamble of Abraham's plea with God on behalf of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Earlier on in chapter 18, when we read in verses 17 and on, God said, shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of God to do righteousness and justice. That righteousness and justice isn't coming because of some explicit lesson that was received. It's a moral sense with which we are all endowed. The capacity to be godly because we have a sense of what godliness signifies. Because God endowed us all with that God-likeness of which we read in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 5, and chapter 9. So, when we consider the message of the Noahide laws, it's not simply a message of obedience. It's a message of integration of godliness into our lives. Now, mind you, we recognize people still sin. We had no further to go than Genesis chapter 4 to encounter the sin of murder, the sin of idolatry, and chapter 6 of sexual immorality. We are endowed with the wherewithal to choose precisely because of that God-likeness with which he endowed us. But that, if anything, is the most exalted, the most inspiring message imaginable. We have the capacity to choose. And if anything, Abraham is the one who so epitomizes that process of integration. So aptly, God says to Abraham in chapter 17, verse 1, I am God Almighty, walk before me. Then be wholehearted. In the Hebrew, lefanai. That verb, hitalech, again rendered here as walk, but walk lefanai, walk before me, provides an illuminating comparison with the way the righteousness of Noah is described in chapter 6, verse 9. There it's, et ha'elohim hitalech noach, noach walked with God. With God, but not before. Abraham goes first, so to speak. He doesn't wait for God to tell him. He intuits because of that God-likeness within him. Noah walks with God, but not before. And there is a final irony in this progression, specifically that pertains to Noah, because we read about the flood in one additional passage in the Bible, and that is in Isaiah chapter 54, in verse 9, when God speaks of the waters of Noah, the flood called the waters of Noah. You know, that's not exactly the sort of association that one might want to have with one's name for all eternity. The waters of the flood are ascribed to Noah, and in our tradition, the answer is 
sadly, yes. Whether it was Noah's dereliction in not actively striving to reform his contemporaries or his dereliction in not praying on their behalf for divine compassion, as did Abraham, in some sense, implicit in these words in Isaiah is the flood is kind of Noah's fault. Obviously, it doesn't mean that all human corruption is attributable to him. But he might have done something about it. He might have at least tried, and he didn't. Because, ironically, sadly, the Noachide covenant, the Noachide laws, are all about integration. And Noah himself didn't really integrate. Certainly not to the extent that Abraham did. So we learn about how to integrate more from Abraham than we do from Noah. But what's crucially important for us, what is indeed the culmination of all of this for us, is this realization. The Noachide laws presume indeed that we have that imprint of the divine in us. We have the wherewithal to choose. We have the wherewithal to make ourselves godly. The summons of these Noachide laws, the summons of the list that, again, I reiterate, should never be construed to be a ceiling, but it's a foundation, is in all of the essential relationships that define your life, strive to make yourself more holy, strive to make yourself more godly, strive to express that inner essence within yourself that comes to its fullest fruition in the noble living that of course goes immeasurably further than mere Kantian moral imperatives. These are the imperatives of God's word. These are the imperatives that teach us all the way to coming to him. I feel compelled to add, as a final postscript, although it really isn't my business, that while the Noahide laws, as we've already seen, are intimated in Genesis chapter 9, are perhaps homiletically implied in Genesis chapter 2, they are fully enunciated in the tradition of the oral Torah, and moreover, perhaps, in the words of James in Acts chapter 15 a proposition that was explicitly articulated by one of the greatest rabbinical scholars of the 18th century, who in his analysis of Christian scripture made this proposal, Rabbi Jacob Emden, that when James refers to those laws that will be expected of the Gentile world, what he is implicitly identifying is the Noachite covenant. The Torah will be read by the Jews in the synagogue. God demands of Israel a system that goes indeed far beyond. Israel has a unique role to play in bringing the entire world to God. But as for the world, for the whole world, the legacy of Noah provides the foundation upon which we build godliness, upon which we are all summoned to attain godliness. The Noahide laws sanctifying all the essential components of life. The greatest blessing to integrate godliness into our lives. God bless you.